Are you ready? What book are we beginning today? Exodus, but what did the Hebrews call it, the Jews? Shamot. Now, I want to help you guys get adjusted to Hebrew. So on the far right is what letter? Shin or sheen, which makes the S-H sound. The M, M sound, and the Ta, T sound. So that's Shemot. And what does Shemot mean? Names. So here we are in Egypt, but guess what? God loves people. So he's not just going to talk about an event of people exiting He's going to call it names because names are what's important. How many of us like people to remember our names? Not just the fact that you went somewhere. Okay. Oh, I know you. You're the one who moved from here to there. I don't remember your name. Okay. Well, God, names are important, which means you are important. You're important to him. Now, how many of you know different people react different ways to the same thing? Two people can go through, look at Jacob and Esau, same family, same life, but they both responded completely differently. Now, all of us know things happen to us growing up or as an adult, and they can influence, let's say, our behavior. But how often do people blame the circumstances they're in for their bad behavior? All the time, people, they're in a circumstance and they behave badly and they say, well, that's because I'm in these circumstances. Well, here's what you have to realize. The same boiling pot of water will harden the egg, but soften the potato. So the boiling water doesn't make you hard or doesn't make you soft. It depends what you're made of. So catch this. Circumstances never define who you are. They only reveal who you are. Okay? That's why the Lord says, it all, the, what's wrong with fire if you're made of gold and silver? It refines you. But if you're made of wood, the fire is a bad thing. So every circumstance is the same way. The circumstances don't define who you are. They reveal who you are by how you respond to it. You following me? This is very, very important. One of the examples that I like to give, how many of you, heaven forbid, would ever do this? You're driving a car down the highway and drinking a cup of coffee. And then all of a sudden, let's say a deer jumps in front of the car and you slam on the brake and the coffee cup tips over and coffee spills out all over in your car. I bet that's never happened to any of you before. Well, here's the big question. How come coffee spilled out of the cup? Okay, you slam on the brakes. Okay, or the cup tipped over due to the force, but none of that's true. Because I did not ask you, why did the cup tip over? I asked you, why did coffee spill out? The reason coffee spilled out was because there was coffee in the cup. What a concept. So the moral of this story is, God will take us through circumstances so our cup will tip over so we can see what's in our cup. We don't know what's in our cup oftentimes. We have no idea. And then all of a sudden something happens and we say something. And it's like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that was in me. And so God puts us through circumstances. He already knows what's in our cup. But we don't know what's in our cup. So he brings things to happen to us. So we realize, oh my goodness, I've got to get that out of my cup. It's time to wash it. Okay, so we start with Exodus 1.1. 1, 1, and it says, these are the Shemot, the names of the sons of Israel who are coming into Egypt with Jacob, a man and his household, have they come. Well, what's fascinating about this book called The Names is in this book, names are always a mystery. They say 
a man took a woman and is like, well, who's, what's their name? You don't find out for several chapters. The whole thing's a mystery. Well, look at this. <clears throat> you know, Pharaoh, what's Pharaoh's name? We have no idea who Pharaoh's names are, but we know who these two slave girls are. Wow, that shows you what God thinks is really valuable and what's important. Now, before I go on, how many of you ever heard of the Hiskos? The Hiskos were the ones who invented the chariot and the horses. And the Hiskos were the pharaoh of Joseph's day. They were not Egyptians, but they were the pharaoh or the leader of that day. That's why they were a Semitic tribe. Egypt's from Ham, okay? Shem, through Shem came the Hiskos, and through Shem came Joseph, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And so that's why their family was welcomed into Egypt. But what happens, if you remember, another pharaoh rises up that doesn't know Joseph. And that pharaoh is the Egyptian pharaoh from Egypt. And they are concerned that there are so many Israelis, now that they just conquered the Hiskos and took control, they don't want Israel to team up with another foreign enemy and put them back into subjugation. Okay, so that's what we find in Exodus 1, 8, and 9. There arose up a new king over Egypt, which didn't know Joseph. And he said to his people, the people and children of Israel are more and mightier than we. They're very concerned. And so in verse 10 and 11, he says, let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply. Well, it's kind of late. They already have. And it comes to pass when there falls out any war, they join our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they set over Israel's taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramesses. Okay. Now, let's look at Exodus 1, 15 and 16. But before we do that, I'm going to give you a quiz. Are you ready? How many years was it from when Jacob and his family entered Egypt to when Moses took them out of Egypt? How long were they in Egypt? 430 years. How many? 600? I will tell you exactly how many years? 215. They were 215 years in Egypt. Okay, <clears throat> so what do we see in Exodus 1, 15 and 16? The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the office of the midwife to the Hebrew women, and you see them on the stools, if it's a son, I want you to kill him. If it's a daughter, then she will live. Well, here's the thing. Shifra comes from the word shofar. And pua means beautiful. And so that's what their names mean. But you know what? They didn't, uh, they say greatness isn't uh, known. The greatness of a person isn't known by their grand actions, but by the little things they do consistently. All too often, people want to wait to do something great that they neglect the little things that they're supposed to be doing, just like in a marriage. It's, you know, oftentimes it's not the big thing, but it's all the little things over and over and over and over and over and over. They had enough of that. But it's those little things that are important. Well, look at what this says in Exodus 117. The midwives feared God, and they didn't do as the king of Egypt commanded, but saved the little boys alive. But look at the insanity of man. What does Pharaoh do? So Pharaoh charges the Egyptians, his own people. And they, he told his own people, the Egyptians, that every son that they give birth to, they have to throw it into the river like trash. That's what the word cast means, into the river. In Hebrew, it means to throw away like trash. Well, now he's commanding his own people to throw away their own children pretty crazy. And then what do we find in Exodus 2, verse 1 and 2? 
there went a man of the house of Levi, and he took to wife a daughter of Levi. They don't give us the names. Who are these two? Who is this couple? Anybody know? Who's the man? Amram. And who's the woman? Yochebed. Exactly. So it's Yochebed and Amram, and that's how they're spelled in Hebrew, going from right to left. Now, it says, the woman conceived, bore a son, and when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. What is the name of the goodly child? Moses. So Amram and Yochaved begat Moses, and she hid him how many months? Three months. Now, here's the big question. What is this son's name? No. He did, okay, because it was Pharaoh's daughter who pulled him out of the water at three months old that called them Moses, but all the Jewish babies are named on their eighth day. Okay, they're circumcised and they received their name. What name did Amram and Yochaved name that child that we call Moses, that Pharaoh's daughter named that? What was his real name? Tovia or Tov. How do we know this? Because the way all of the tribes were named in the Bible, it says right here, he was a goodly child. And the word for good is Tov. So this tells us as a hint to his real name was Tovia. Now, she hid him for three months. And then what happened? If you remember, they have to throw all the babies into the Nile. Well, mama says, well, I'll put my baby in the Nile, but I'm going to put him in a basket. Okay, so she sets the basket. She's following orders. She puts him in a basket, though. And it's floating around. Now, let me ask you this. What was, who, what other kids did Amram and Yochaved have? Aaron and Miriam, they're older. Okay, so what's the deal? They got a boy and a girl. Why, why in the world should they trouble having a third kid if, it might be, if it's a boy, it might be killed? So the story goes, most, uh, Amram and Yochaved split up. And then it was Miriam who brought them back together because Miriam says, hey, Pharaoh is not allowing any boys to be born, but by you not coming together, you're not allowing any girls to be born either. You're condemning both. So that's why they came back together and they had the baby Moses, and that's why this whole incident happened. They just needed to rely on God. You know, we have, when it comes to the government telling us to do things, you know, sometimes you might have to rely on God and not do what the government says. But if the government says to do something and it's, it's not unbiblical, okay, well, then you have to really decide, well, what's the boundary between, I mean, here, Pharaoh's daughter did what they said. She put the baby in the water and put him in a basket, okay? A lot of times we just have to rely on God, all right? Sometimes, you know, this is where we have to be in prayer. Now, here's what's crazy. Yochaved. And Amram got married and beget Moses, who was the redeemer for all of Israel. What does Yochaved's name mean in English? Okay, let me help. I'm going to highlight. What does this say? Kaved or kavod, and what does that mean? That's glory, God's glory but it also means heavy, weighty. It's translated as hardened when it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. It's that word. So it means to make heavy, just like the weight of God's glory to come down. It's heavy and it comes down. So it has different meanings, but that word in this sense means the glory of Yah. The yud Hey vav Hey. there's the yud vav So her name meant the glory of God. Now, what does Amram's name mean? Am is people, 
Ram means to be exalted, so it means an exalted people. They've been set apart. Israel has been. They're an exalted people. So what happens? The glory of God weds an exalted people, and the Messiah comes. They give birth to the Messiah. God is waiting for the glory to be put upon an exalted people, which means to be holy, to be separate. He's waiting for us to be separate. Now, speaking of this book being the book of names, here's another name that is hidden from us. But look how often this is said. We're going to talk about the daughter of Pharaoh. Now, that's not her name, but look at Exodus 2, 5 through 10. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. Her maidens walked along by the river side, and when she saw the little basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to fetch it, and when she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the baby was crying. She had compassion on him and said, why, this is one of the Hebrews' children. How did she know? Because he was circumcised. And then it says, that uh, she, then her sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, let's put a little Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call to you a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, well, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take the child away and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. And so the woman took the child and nursed it. The child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. So it was like three years later that he gets the name of Moses. But here we see Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's daughter. Does anybody that know the name? Just don't say it if you know, but raise your hand if you know the name of Pharaoh's daughter. All we see is Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's daughter. What do you think it is? Okay, what do you think it is? Oh, if you read your notes, you can see. <laughs> All right, it is Bat Yah, the daughter of Yah. Just like daddy and dad, Yah and Yahweh. Her name was the daughter of God, the daughter of Yah. That wasn't her Egyptian name. That wasn't her Egyptian name. It was a name given to her by God because she saved Moses and all of Israel. Now, Pharaoh, uh, I mean Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter, Bat Yah, okay, who she was the adopted mother of Moses. Moses at three years old lived with his mother, Pharaoh's daughter, for the rest of his life, pretty much, until he left, don't you think he's really close to his mom? You bet he is. Do you think he would want her to cross the Red Sea when he crossed the Red Sea with everyone else? Okay, guess what? She did. His adoptive mom, Pharaoh's daughter, Cross the Red Sea with them in freedom. Did you know that's in the Bible? I'm going to show you where it is in the Bible. That's why things are hidden. They're mysteries, but they're all there. <clears throat> so what do we have? Now, you got to remember, it's a different Pharaoh now. Pharaoh's daughter's dad has died. It's another Pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph or anything, So she's not under pressure from her mom or dad. They're dead. She's now older, you know, older than Moses. If Moses is 80, she's in her 90s, okay, 99 or something like that. You know, if she was 19 or she might have been 16 or whatever. But here is what happened. First off, they say when Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to wash herself, they say actually... She was getting a mikvah, and she was going against all the idols of Egypt. She was turning herself over to the Lord. But look at this. In 
1 Chronicles 4.15, it talks about the sons of Caleb. And then in verse 18, it says, and these are the sons of Baya, the daughter of Pharaoh, who which Merid took. She had married one of the other Jews while they were still in Egypt. And when she crossed, she was already Jewish and married to a Jewish man and went across the river with him. Now, here's what it says. It says that God rewarded her for her actions, and this is what God told her. Moses was not your son, yet you called him your son. Well, you were not my daughter, but now I call you my daughter. Isn't that just cool? Okay. And they say uh, there's a midrash that attributes the entire salvation of all of Israel to the daughter of Pharaoh because she's the one who saved Moses. Well, let's look at Exodus 2, verse 11 through 15. It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, he went out to his brothers and he looked on their burden. So Moses is paying attention and he's looking on their burden burdens. In a little bit, we're going to see how God also was looking on their burdens. But right now it's Moses. And he saw an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew and one of his brothers. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw there was no man, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, there were two guys that were fighting. And he said to the one that did the wrong, why are you smiting your fellow? And the guy said, well, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? And now Moses' knees are knocking, and he said, uh-oh, everybody knows this. Well, when Pharaoh heard it, he wanted to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now, did you notice what that person said? Who made you a prince and a judge over us? We have a clue as to who that was, those two people that were fighting. Because look what happens in Numbers 16, verse 12 and 13. Moses went and called the sons of Reuben, Dathan, and Abiram. This is in the matter of Korah. Uh, and they said, he's told them to come up. And they go, we will not come up. Is this a small thing that you brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, but you have to make yourself a prince over us? So Dathan and Abiram were more than likely the two that were fighting earlier, and they accused him of wanting to make himself a prince over them. Well, now, here those two are saying the very same thing. Now, who could tell me Moses' father-in-law's name? Jethro? Did I hear Jethro? Okay. What else? Any other name? He had like six names because they weren't their names. It was titles. So let's take a look. Exodus 2, 16 through 19. There was a priest of Midian. And just so you know, the word there doesn't have to mean priest. It could mean a king or ruler. But there was a priest of Midian and he had seven daughters. And they came and drew water and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. But then the shepherds came and drove them away. So Moses stood up and he helped them and watered their flock. And then when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, how come you got here so quickly? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. Well, Ruel means a friend of God. So that's one of his titles. That's not his name. But one of the things that struck me this morning when I was teaching this that I hadn't ever really seen before, it's always fun looking at the Bible and seeing different comparisons come. But here, Moses, in one sense, who is a type of a redeemer, Yeshua, what happens, he's looked at as an Egyptian, which today the Israels think of him as non-Jewish, okay, because the church has put Egyptian clothing on him to present him to the Jews. But the other thing is this, the daughters say that the Redeemer delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds. And we know pastors are called shepherds, and they're supposed to shepherd the flock. But the problem is too many pastors are fleecing the flock instead of feeding the flock. 
And when you read Ezekiel, God is very up, upset in Ezekiel about the shepherds of Israel who are doing just that. Now, Exodus 2, 23, it came to pass in the process of time, the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried and their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage. And then in chapter three, verse one and two, Moses kept the flock of Jethro. So now he's called Jethro. And that means his excellency. That's what that name means. That's his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the back 40 and came to the mountain of God, even Horeb or Mount Sinai. And an angel of the Lord appears to him in a flame of fire out of the middle of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. Now who's in the bush? The Lord is, the Yudhe Vafe. But I think it's interesting that it says it's an angel of the Lord who appeared. All right. Now, if it's a burning bush and God's in it, it's going to be a big burning bush. Now, here's the thing that's fascinating. Look at what God says in Exodus 3, 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So God is saying to Moses, I feel like you feel. Now, Deuteronomy 4, 24 says, the Lord your God is a consuming fire, right? But how come the bush isn't consumed? That's like seeing a house on fire and the fire is going, but the house is still standing there. The reason why, God's in the bush. God's protecting the bush, okay? So even though the bush is on fire, God doesn't allow it to be consumed because he's there to protect the bush. Okay, so what is, since God is a consuming fire, what's the Hebrew word for fire? Aish, it's the aleph and the shin. The aleph represents an ox, something big and strong that goes first, and the shin represents fire. So, aish, a strong, or the shin represents to destroy, destruction. So what is a strong destruction? Fire, right? Well, what happens is this. Here's God, a big consuming fire. Now, let me ask you something. Oh, and let's put Yah. Yah, yud hey is in the middle of the bush. That's the only reason why the bush doesn't get consumed. Now, God's a consuming fire. We just read that, right? Are we created in God's image? Are we created in God's image? Therefore, man is a consuming fire, and woman is a consuming fire, because we're created in God's image, and he's a consuming fire. The Hebrew word for fire we saw was ish, right? Well, guess what? The Hebrew word for man and woman both have that word in it because we're both consuming fires as well. The Hebrew word for man, ish, is the aleph sheen with the yud in the middle and yud is hand. So man is defined as the one who's working in the midst of the fire. Woman, well, as you can see, man's a consuming fire. Woman also is a consuming fire because she has the aleph sheen and then the letter he. And the letter he at the end is to reveal. So woman is what the fire reveals, the gold, the silver, the precious stones. Okay, that's, that is a woman. But notice this, when man and woman come together in marriage, the man brings the letter Yud, the woman brings the letter He that forms God's name and they won't consume each other. But if God is not in their midst, all they have is fire and they consume each other. Isn't that a fascinating thing for marriage relationships? Now, so what happens in Exodus 3, 3 through 6? Moses says, I'm going to turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush isn't burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called him out of the desert or out of the midst of the bush. And he goes, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, 
don't come closer. Take your shoes off your feet for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look on God. Now, in Psalm 68, 4, look at that. Sing to God, sing praises to his name, extol him that rides upon the heaven by his name, what? Yah, there it is. And then in Exodus 3, 8, God says, I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of the land to a good land and a large one, a land flowing with milk and honey, the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the, all the ites, all the ites. And then in Exodus 3.10, now I thought this was fascinating that God is coming down to deliver his children. And what does he do in chapter 3, verse 10? Come now, therefore, and I'm going to send you to Pharaoh that you may bring forth my people and the children of Israel out of Egypt. So what does that tell us? God uses you to accomplish his will. He uses people. And he wants Moses to bring out his people. Now, in Exodus 32, 7, the Lord says to Moses, you go get down for your people, which, brought, which you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. It's kind of like a husband and a wife and the kid is bad. That's your kid. No, that's your kid. So God and Moses are hashing it out who they belong to. Matter of fact, in Exodus 32, 11, Moses sought the Lord as God. And he said, Lord, why does your wrath wax hot against your people, which you brought out of the land of Egypt? Okay, they're both blaming each other. Well, in Exodus 3, verse 11 and 12, Moses says to God, or Elohim, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, so God is telling Moses, certainly I will be with you. And what's the Hebrew word for I will be? Eh, yeah. Okay. Eh, yeah means I am. In other words, like I am what I am. I am who I am. But it could also be translated as I will be who I will be. I will be what I will be. That word is all past, present, and future. All three of them. And in Exodus 3, uh, 13, Moses says to God, well, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say, what's his name? See how the book of Shemot or names is all about names. And he says, what am I supposed to say? And he said, Eheyeh, Asher, Eheyeh, how we close the priestly blessing every week. Now in Exodus 3, 14, Elohim says to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus tell the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Okay. Eh, yeah. He didn't say all three words, just one, like daddy and dad. He shortened it. And it just says, I will be. So I'll be whatever you need. You need a dad, I'm your dad. You need a mom, I'm your mom. You need a judge, I'm your judge. You need a king, I'm your king. Whatever you need. Well, what's fascinating about that name, I am, look at Isaiah 48, 12. God is speaking and he says, hearken to me, O Jacob and Israel, my called, I am he. You got that? I am he. I am the first and the last. I'm the alpha and omega. I'm the aleph and the tav. My hand is the one that laid the foundations of the earth. My right hand spread out the heavens. When I called out to them, they stood up. Yes, sir. Okay, so who's speaking here? It's the Yudhe Vave. And he says, I am he. Well, look at John 18, 4 through 6. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Yeshua, knowing all things that were happening to him, said to them, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for Yeshua of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And what happens? Everyone falls to the ground. It's powerful. When he said that, they all went backward and fell. Okay. Now, look what God says in Exodus 3, 18. How many of you know Moses added to the word of God? 
And did you know Moses also subtracted from the word of God? And in Deuteronomy 4, he says, don't you add or subtract. Why? Because he learned his lesson because he added and subtracted from the word of God. And I'm going to prove it to you. In Exodus 3, 18, I'll put it up in the PowerPoint. This is what God told Moses to say. First off, in Exodus 3, 18, he says, the Egyptians are going to hear your voice and you, and I want you to go with the chiefs of Israel. I want you all to go to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and here's what I want you to say. The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has come to us. Please let us then go on a three-day journey into the wasteland to make an offering to the Lord our God. That's what he is supposed to say. And he's supposed to be polite. He's supposed to say, please. Okay, well, let's look what he says in Exodus 5, 1. He doesn't say the Lord God of the Hebrews. He doesn't say that he's come to us. He doesn't ask nicely. He doesn't say, please. He doesn't even tell him it's a three-day journey. As far as they know, Pharaoh knows he's never coming back. And then he never says to make an offering. He never says to the Lord our God. All he says is the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go. That's not what he said. And he says so that they may keep a feast to me in the wasteland. That's not at all what God told him to say. And he fails miserably. So he goes, oops, I, that's right. I was to say what God wanted me to say. So he tries a second time. He forgets to say the Lord, but he does better. He says, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go on a three-day journey into the wasteland, make an offering to the Lord our God. And then he adds this, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. He's subtracting from what God says. He's adding to what God said. And then we wonder why Pharaoh didn't do what was done. Also, he only went with Aaron. He was supposed to take all the chiefs. He didn't take all the chiefs. He used the wrong name for God. He wasn't polite. He was demanding. He never gave a time frame. As far as Pharaoh knew, they were just going on strike. They're going on a holiday. Okay. And so how does Pharaoh respond? Here we are in Egypt. Here comes Pharaoh. And his big response is, who's the Lord? Why obey his voice? Why let Israel go? So there's three things to this question. First off, who is the Lord? I don't even know this God. And then he says, why obey his voice? Which means I don't think if he is God, he's interested in what goes on on earth. So why should I obey him? And then he says, why should I let Israel go? I don't think your God has the power over me to let him go. So why? What's the big deal? Okay, well, I want to show you this chart that I believe is on the table over there. There's something very uh, just crazy about this whole incident. And the first thing God is going to say, answering his question, in Exodus 7, 17, He's proving his existence. He said, who is the Lord? I am the Lord. And then he proves his providence, which is why should I obey him? He doesn't get involved in the earth. And so his providence is here. I'm the Lord in the midst of the earth. I do get involved. And then the next one is, does he have the power? Well, this is the Holy Spirit. And here in Exodus 9, 14, he shows there's no one like him in all the earth. So that's what he's doing. He's showing the three manifestations by answering those three questions. Now, going across, what's interesting is the first, the fourth, the seventh plague all begin with early in the morning, the events happened. And then the next three are all go to Pharaoh. And then the last three, every time there is no warning given. And the purpose of all this is he says, because he wants all of Egypt to know his existence when he brings out the children of Israel, his providence, and he gets involved by putting a division between my people and your people and his power when he cuts them off from the earth. So this is set up in a pattern, but guess what? The pattern also goes down as well. Here, 
Every one of these plagues is proving his existence Every, and there's no deaths. Then the next one, all those plagues, there's the death of animals and finally the death of man and beast. And there's warnings are given that these things are going to happen. But anyway, it's a really cool chart. You can kind of see the matrix of all this. And then lastly, as we close this part, um, Exodus 4.21. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go to return to Egypt, see that you do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I put in your hand, but I will harden his heart and not let his people go. How many think, and I used to always think that it's not fair for Pharaoh. God's a little bigger. God's a little stronger. How can Pharaoh be held accountable when God hardens his heart? Fair question. Well, guess what? The problem is English. English is horrible. Okay. The word, now this word right here is just like Yokaved. Here it is, the kavod, and that means to harden because it's weighty. God never hardens Pharaoh's heart. Every time that word is used, Pharaoh is hardening his own heart. Whenever God hardens Pharaoh's heart, it's not kavod, it's kazak. Remember, at the end of every book, kazak, kazak, vinat, kazak, it means to strengthen. God never hardens his heart to prevent him from having a free will. He strengthens his heart so he can have the will to go on. It's like a boxing match, and God is just whipping up on Pharaoh. Seven rounds have gone. He's collapsing, and God comes up and says, no, 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 I've got three more plagues to go. Here, have some water. Have some, be refreshed. You've got to get your energy back because i got to whip up on you three more times. <laughs> it's a different word in Hebrew. Okay, so with that said, let's stand. We'll take a break. <clears throat> Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we thank you that you are alive and you are watching over all the events that happen on earth. You're watching over us because you are a God who not only exists, but you get involved in the affairs of men. And we're also very grateful that you have the power to do whatever needs to be done for your will to be done. But Father, I pray that you would be speaking to all of our hearts and our souls. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, heart to understand how all of this is so alive today with how you'll be like a big chess game. You're going to be moving both sides, all the pieces. And Father, we just pray that we don't mind even if we're a pawn, if we can defend like never before. Or if we're on the offense, we pray you give us the uh, ability to not add to your word or subtract from your word, but just say exactly what you want to say. Work in each and every one of us, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. We're thankful for all of those around the world, locally here, around the United States, all over the world, that help so into your ministry. This isn't ours. It's all yours. We, we just are responsible for uh, what we do with your kingdom and how we respond. So, Father, we just thank you for all those all over uh, the internet that see the importance of being a light to the nations and so into this work of yours in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord, our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord, our God. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> what this session is about is about digging deeper into uh, the Brit Hadashah or the New Testament. And so I want to begin with Herod Antipater the first. Let me bring this little chart up. Okay, first, there was Herod Antipas. There's a lot of Herods. There's a dozen Herods. And if you don't keep the Herods straight, you get confused. So I'm going to straighten out all the Herods for you. Made that making more confusing. But Herod Antipas 
was an Edomite. And I'm going to show you in a little bit that the Maccabees, remember the story of Hanukkah and the Maccabees. As the Maccabee generations go, one of them forced all of the Edomites to either give up their land or convert to Judaism. Well, Herod Antipas was one of those Edomites who converted. He was a Gentile, but he converted to Judaism. He is the one who fathered Herod Antipater. Now, Herod Antipater married the daughter of an Arab sheik known as Cyprus. And so they were sweethearts and they got married. Now, they had a couple kids. One of them was Salome the first, and the other was Herod the Great of Matthew 2 that killed all the babies when Jesus was born. Okay, so Herod the Great claimed to be Jewish, but his mother wasn't Jewish, and his father wasn't Jewish. He was a convert to Judaism, though. So Herod had 10 wives. All right, I will share with you some of them. His, one of his first wives was Doris. And Herod the Great and Doris had Herod Antipater, named after Grandpa, Antipater II. Well, Herod also had a wife named Malthase. And Herod and Malthase had some kids. One of them was Herod Archelaus of Matthew chapter 2, verse 22. Another one was Herod Philip I, you see in Luke 3, 1. Another one was Herod Antipas in Matthew 14 and Luke 13. He also married a lady, not Cleopatra of Egypt, but Cleopatra of Jerusalem. And now he also married another lady named Miriam the Second. Now, Herod and Cleopatra had Philip the Tetrarch, that's mentioned in the Bible. And Miriam the Second, her father was a Levitical priest named Simon Bothus. So he was not, he was the high priest. So here we have this guy that's a high priest from the Maccabees, and they give birth to Miriam the Second, who is a Maccabee from the Levitical tribe. And there was a problem between the Maccabees and Herod's, Herod, and the way they solved it is by having a marriage. And so now Miriam is married to Herod the Great, and Herod the Great loves Miriam, and they have a child called Herod Philip II. And Salome, and uh, who was Herod the Great's sister, had a daughter named Bernice. And Bernice had a couple of kids. One of them was this lady named Herodias, and her brother was Herod Agrippa I of Acts 12. Then she married Herod the Philip II, and they had Salome II, and she married Philip the Tetrarch. Are you following this genealogy? Well, Herodias married Herod Antipas. So you've got quite a situation going on here. But what happened? When Herod the Great was about to die, his firstborn son, Antipater II, there were some problems. He had thrown him in jail. And what happens? He tells the jailer, Look, my dad's about to die. Why don't you let me out of jail? I'll kill him, and then I'll make you the jailer, this fancy role in the government. So what does the jailer do? He goes and tells Herod the Great, who turns around and has his son put to death. So that didn't work real well. But there's something about Herod Antipater. He was very prideful, and he wanted to rule, and he was ready to kill his dad. And we're going to look at that incident here in a little bit. But let me kind of cover the story. So here's what we got. Let me come over here to this chart. We kind of just covered all of this. So I'm going to add now. 
Mattathias, okay, he was a Jewish priest, and he had sons, Simon Thassi, John Hyrcanus then, and he had Judas Aristobulus and Alexander Janus. There was a Salome of Alexandra, and she was married to Judas Aristobulus, and because they're Levites, when Judas Aristobulus dies, she marries his brother, Alexander Janus. And they have Aristobulus II and John Hyrcanus II. And so those are their two kids. And I'll stop there for a moment. And I'm going to read to you what had transpired through all of this. In the days of Mattathias, the one at the top, who was a priest, remember David had 24 courses of priests and Abijah was the eighth course where Zechariah was. The first course was uh, Yehoarib and what happened, Mattathias was of that course. He decided to leave Jerusalem and go to a little town about, you know, I don't know, 15 miles away called Moedin. Okay, Moedin, that's where the whole story of Hanukkah took place. Well, He's the one, uh, he had five sons. One of them was Judah Maccabee, the hammer. And so he was the son of this priest, and he's the one who led the Maccabean revolt. Well, in 168 is when uh, Antiochus Epiphanes was the big problem. And uh, this is when Simon Thassi, that you see on the left, fathered John Hyrcanus, okay? Well, John Hyrcanus became the high priest and uh, in the second century BC, around 160, and he died about 104. Well, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were always fighting during that time. Who wants to have control? Well, he sided with the Sadducees. Well, Hyrcanus the one that you uh, see here, John Hyrcanus the first, he's the one who started a military campaign against the Edomites, and he is the one who insisted on forced conversions, and this is why Herod Antipas converted, not because he wanted to, but because he would lose his land if he didn't. Uh, Hyrcanus instituted these forced conversions uh, on the Edomites, and this was unprecedented move for a Judean ruler. And Hyrcanus threatened that any Edomite who wanted to keep their land, they had to be circumcised and enter into the tradition of the Jews. So Herod Antipater, the son of the one who converted, was circumcised around 10 years old, not as a baby. And um, nevertheless, Herod's family, uh, Herod uh, Antipater, his family had very much influence and they became resented by many of the Jews because they were really Edomites. So what happened, John Hyrcanus, what he ended up doing, he ended up dividing the kingdom. This is when the Maccabees were both priests and kings, okay? And so uh, what happened here, in his will, he made a provision that the high priesthood would be separate from secular authority. His widow, who um, was Salome Alexandra, let's see, it has here, was given the control of the throne, of the civil authority, and his son, Judas Aristobulus, do you see Judas Aristobulus there? Okay, uh, was given the role of the high priest. And so... Uh, that's how he tried to solve the fights, the inner fights between the families. However, Aristobulus was not happy with that. So guess what he does? He cast his mother, Salome Alexandra, into prison and let her starve to death. That's how he solved that. And then he killed three of his brothers and he imprisoned Alexander Janus, his half-brother. 
Then Aristobulus was not only the first king from the Hasmonean lineage, but he was the first of any Hebrew king to claim the priesthood as well. But he only reigned for one year. And then Salome Alexandra, who was married to Judas Aristobulus, when he died, there was a Levite marriage where she married Alexander Janus and then had those two kids. But Alexander Janus, even though he was successful uh, throughout the battlefield, he was very Hellenistic, which is who the Maccabees were fighting against. And what Alexander uh, Janus did one time, he hated the Pharisees. He was sided with the Sadducees. And on Sukkot, as you know, you have the Lulavs and you have the big yellow Etrogs, right? Well, if you remember during the Sukkot holiday, the big deal is the pouring out of the water, the water libation, okay? They go all the way down to the Pool of Siloam. They get this big pitcher of water and a bottle of, of uh, wine, and they'd head up to the altar. They'd march around it seven times. And then the priest would go to a corner of the altar, and they would pour the water and the wine or the blood in the corner of the altar. Well, he's the high priest, and he thinks the whole thing's stupid. So he takes the water, and he pours it on his feet, Everybody gets mad, and there's a thousand people with etrogs throwing them at him. He gets pelted with etrogs from every direction, and now he is really mad. And so, <laughs> they also said he was a descendant of a illegitimate uh, woman kind of thing. He killed six thousand people, his fellow citizens, mostly Pharisees, their wives and their children. And this was a major factor that led up to the Judean civil war, which was the Pharisees against the Sadducees. Well, not long after that, the Pharisees, which had a powerful school for rabbis, they incited a revolt that would turn into a six-year-long civil war. During that civil war, 50,000 Jews were killed. Alexander Janus then died in 76 BC and left his kingdom to his wife, Queen Salome of Alexandra. What you're going to see happens, if you remember, it is said that Solomon's temple was destroyed because of baseless hatred between the Jews. They say the, uh, the temple in Rome was destroyed because of baseless hatred toward one another. It's, and the, the whole civil war that they had is what led Herod the Great to take over. They invited Rome to come to solve their problems. This is why Paul says, don't go to the court, solve your problems yourself. When you go invite someone else in, you're causing big problems for everybody. Well, as I said, Salome, Alexandra had two sons, John Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II. And they were fighting over who was going to have the key positions. And so the way they resolved this, John Hyrcanus had Alexandra, this nice lady, and Aristobulus had Antigenus, and he's the one who chased Herod away to Rome, but then Herod came back. Well, they also had Alexander. And how do you solve problems? Marry between the families. So Alexander... And Alexandra got married. And they had Mary Am the first. So she is also one of the Maccabees. And she also marries Herod the Great. And Alexandra and Alexander also had kids. Aristobulus the third. And so Mary Am the first and Aristobulus the third are brother and sister. Now, Mary Am with Herod had kids, Alexander and Aristobulus IV. But what happens one day, Herod the Great, I'll tell you the story in a little bit, kills his wife and her kids. And I will tell you why shortly. Okay, Mary Am was revolted by her husband's heartless murder of most of the members of her family in order to satisfy, uh, to satisfy his selfish ambitions. And she 
was one of these independent women that let him know. And yet, despite this, Herod was madly in love with his wife, too madly in love, but it did not stop Herod from carrying out his ugly schemes. Herod did not want anyone telling him what to do. Well, Mary Ann, her brother is Aristobulus III. What does Herod do? He appoints a non-Levite, unimportant person to become the high priest. Oh, no. Okay, so Alexandra, the right here, the mother of these two wants her son to be high priest. And Herod isn't complying. So what does she do with all of her wisdom? She goes to Cleopatra of Egypt, who's very powerful queen, and she goes to Mark Antony, the ruler of Rome, to intervene with Herod on her son's behalf. That did not make Herod happy. Despite of all of Alexandra's efforts, it was finally, it was Mary Ann who persuaded Herod to depose the other man and appoint Aristobulus to be the high priest. Herod does what she says, and then she, he has him killed and drowned and made it look like an accident. So he complied, and then he killed the guy. All right. Uh, what had happened was there was a festival held in Jericho and he hired some young men to keep the high priest underwater while he was bathing until he drowned and then have it appear as an accident. Herod appeared to be very, oh, so sorry, but everyone knew it was his fault. Well, Alexandra had even succeeded in having Herod call before a Roman court to answer for the crime But what does he do while he's in Rome? Through bribery, he ends up escaping blame and punishment and comes back. Well, guess what? Before Herod left for Rome, after Alexandra did that to him, he arranged with his sister's husband. Okay, here's Herod. His sister is Salome, who's married to a man named Joseph. And Joseph that if Herod was proven guilty in Rome and was going to be killed and not return, Joseph was to kill Miriam and all of her children. Because if anything happened to Herod, he didn't want anyone else to get his lovely wife, Miriam. But here was the problem. Joseph really, really liked Miriam. So he goes and tells her what her husband's planning to do to kill her if he dies. Well, that did not make Miriam any more happy about Herod. And so <clears throat> she gave him the what for when Herod came back. He said, Joseph told me that you wanted me killed if you were killed. And sometimes you should keep your mouth shut, maybe better off. But she's just blasting into him. Well, so what happened Joseph's admiration for Maryam made Herod's sister, Salome, very jealous. And so Salome tells Herod that her husband, Joseph, has a thing for his wife, Maryam. You see how this is unfolding? Okay. Well, he ordered his brother-in-law, Joseph, to be killed without even trying to find out if what she was saying was true. But his love for Miriam was too strong to punish her. The next time Herod had to go away, he left someone else in charge to guard and watch Mary Ann, and he was told to kill her and her children if he didn't come back. Well, Herod came back, and his sister again tried to make trouble for Mary Ann anyway, and This time, Salome told Herod that Mary Ann was planning to poison him. And so in a mad rage, she was tried by the men of his tribunal. And even though she was innocent, they condemned her to death. And she died. All right? So you're kind of getting an idea here of all of these guys. Okay, so here we go. All of them were killed. And then 
Antipater II, who was Herod's firstborn, okay, you have him, but then you have Bernice and Aristobulus. Before he died, they had kids, and guess who they had? They had Herod Agrippa, the first of Acts 12, and they had a daughter named Herodias, and Herodias and Herod Agrippa were brothers and sisters, and Herodias ended up marrying Herod Antipas of Matthew, and they were married, and they had a child who was Salome the second. And guess what? Salome the second and her mother were the ones that wanted to kill John the Baptist. And Herod Agrippa had Herod Agrippa the second. All right. So you following all that? And then Aristobulus the third, who was brother to Mary Am, also was murdered. And yeah, that we got, okay, now let me go back one again. Now, it was interesting that again, Antipater II, he wanted to be king so much he was willing to kill his dad. Now, do you remember the story that they killed all of the babies, two years old and younger, right? So what did Joseph and Mary do? They went to Egypt. But let me explain how all of this happened. I know the exact day and date of Yeshua's birth. He was born on the first day of Sukkot in the Hebrew year 3757 AM, uh, which means from creation, which on the Julian calendar was the fall of 4 BC going into the spring of 3 BC. We know he was born in Bethlehem in the fall of 4 BC. And then we know after a month, he went to the temple to be dedicated. Now we know that the wise men had not yet come a month later. How do we know what in Leviticus, what did if they had a son, what was the offering they were to make? After 30 days, he's no longer, you know, unclean. They go, they dedicate the child. What offering was she supposed to bring? A lamb and then a pigeon or a turtle dove. But it says if they were so poor, they couldn't afford a lamb, then they could bring the two turtle doves or two pigeons. And Joseph and Mary brought the two turtle doves and the two pigeons because they were so poor. But what happens See, this is in like September, October, the last of Sukkot. It was the following month that the Magi came with all of the riches because they couldn't afford it, but they needed money. So God made sure they had money so they had money to support themselves in Egypt. That's why the wise men came. They're about to go into Egypt and they're going to need finances. And if they can't even afford a lamb, how are they going to support themselves in Egypt? So the wise men come the next month and then they get the funds and then... What happens, uh, the wise men came who had seen the star, but the star actually had come two years earlier. They waited two years from seeing the star to go to Bethlehem to find the young child. And then we know they left a different way and didn't tell Herod. And uh, that's why Herod, you know, wanted to have all the babies killed two years and younger. Now, here's my next quiz. How long were Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus in Egypt? How long do you think they were in Egypt? Any guesses? I don't hear anybody. It's okay to be wrong. <laughs> Three years? Yeah, I know. He was only there about five months. And I can prove it. I will show you. It's all in the Bible and science, and history. Get a load of this. If you go to NASA's website, it lists all of the solar lunar eclipses for 5,000 years. And we find there was a lunar eclipse on March 13th of 3 BC. 
and it was seen all over Israel. Josephus records this event. Okay, now I'm going to give you another test. You can only have a new uh, a total solar eclipse when? When can you have a total solar eclipse? There's only one day a month you can have a total solar eclipse. On the first day of the month, all of Israel's months are based on the sighting of the new moon. God tells Moses, look at this new moon here. This is the beginning, the first of the month. Okay? Now, when can you have a total lunar eclipse only one time a month? The full moon, which is on the 15th of the month. Right? Right in there. The middle of the month is the full moon. If this is a lunar eclipse, it tells you it's the middle of the month, right? What is in the middle of the month of March? Purim, Purim, the very day the Amalekites, you know, wanted to kill all the Jews in the book of Esther. So here we see a total lunar eclipse seen in Israel on the festival of Purim, while Joseph is still in Egypt with Mary and the baby, okay? Well, Herod was like on his deathbed. And when all the Jews saw the lunar eclipse, they said, hooray, Herod's going to die. That's what this means. Herod's going to die, probably by Passover, okay? So Herod, as you know, he's married to a Maccabee who celebrates Hanukkah all the time. And they celebrate Purim all the time. And in Purim, they make a mockery of the kings, okay? And, and Haman and Amalek, they all make a big party and a mockery. Herod knows how they keep Hanukkah. Herod knows how they keep Purim. And he's afraid after all the celebrations of Purim and then having this, that their Jews are going to mock him and make a fool of him when he dies and he thinks he's such a great king, everyone should mourn for him at his death. So he tells his troops on the day that he dies, they're to kill like 50,000 Jews so they mourn on his death. He does not want his death to be a day of rejoicing, but a day of mourning. So he tells the soldiers, go kill a whole, slaughter a whole bunch of Jews when the day I die. So they'll remember it as a day of mourning for me. Okay. Well, um, let's see. Another thing. Rome, right before Herod died, Rome had made a demand that Herod put their emblem of a big golden eagle on the entrance to the temple. Well, he complied and he did it. But the Jews didn't appreciate that. And so they tore it down and cut it into pieces, okay? Well, if you look on your notes at Hosea 8, chapter 1, the Jews had read this verse, set the shofar to your mouth. He will come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they've transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. So they saw this putting up of the eagle as kind of like a fulfillment of this verse, and they tear it down. Well, what does Herod do after they tear it down? He kills a whole bunch of people and he locks the top leaders of the Jews, the sages, up with a command that on the day he dies, they have to kill all of the sages. So they will mourn on the day of his death. Now, here's what Josephus says, who lived during that time. Uh, he said that Herod had no affection or goodwill towards his son, the uh, Antipater the second, and to restrain him, and so he put him in jail. And it says the jailer said he that Herod Antipater wanted to kill Herod the Great. So Herod the Great cries out. He beats his head on the wall, and he raised himself on his elbow and told his guards and commanded them to go kill Antipater without any delay, and then bury him in a horrible way. Well, Antipater had wanted to be king. Herod dies a month later in April, just before Passover. And upon his death, his son 
Archelaus becomes king, and everyone hoped it's going to be better. Now, let me come back to here for a second. So here we had Herod Archelaus of Matthew 2.22. He kills this son from Doris, and he wants to put Malthus's son, Herod Archelaus, as king. Well, when he becomes king, all the Jews rejoice that Herod died, and they're hoping he's going to be a better king. And so they ask him to let go all of the sages in prison that were supposed to die when Herod died, and he just died. Well, what does he do? Instead, it's Passover. They're celebrating Passover, and he sent in armed troops and slaughtered 3,000 people in the temple area. He canceled Passover and sent everybody home. Now, look at Matthew 2, 20 and 21. The Lord speaks to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. He arose, took the young child and his mother, and came to the land of Israel. It says they, not he. There was more than one person that wanted this supposed Messiah dead. Who was it? It was Herod and his son Antipater, because he wanted to become king. He was the one searching for this Messiah to get him killed too. So when it says they, that's who it was referring to. But fortunately, Herod killed his own son, and then he died. And then in Matthew 2, 22 and 23 on your notes, it says, when he had heard that Archelaus reigned in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he sure didn't want to go there. So being warned of God in a dream, he goes instead to the parts of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophets, he'd be a Nazarene. So what I'm going to do is take a picture of this chart and have it on the table for you next week. So you can kind of follow along as you read the New Testament to know who's who in the Herod family. But what's amazing is, you know, Yeshua was born like in October on Sukkot. November, the wise men come. December, he leaves to Egypt. And then what happens, January, February, March, this big eclipse comes. That's all recorded in history. And then a month later, right before uh, Passover, Herod dies, Archelaus becomes king, and then Yeshua comes back because they had died who wanted to kill him, but he goes to Nazareth instead of Jerusalem because Archelaus is there as king. Does all that make sense now? Okay. Who wants to repeat it back for me? (laughs) Let's stand and we'll close with prayer.